Well, Bob and Mike, thank you for spending time with us. How did this whole incredible journey start in tennis for you guys? Man, it, uh, it started at two years old. We, we hit our first ball, and um, our parents own a club in Camarillo, California. They were both pretty good players. My mom um, was a pro. She played Wimbledon and all, all the slams, and my dad was number one at UCSB. So uh, tennis was in the family, and uh, just remember hanging out at the club you know, our whole life. We were, that was our life. You know, show up at 8 a.m. at the Cabrillo Rat Club, picking up papers all the way down the street. Um, you know, and my dad was, would sweep some stuff. He'd get the club ready for all the members to show up. And, uh, you know, we'd run around, swim, make forts in the trees, and, and then, um, yeah, play tennis. It was just what everyone was doing. How important was it that your parents did such a great job making it fun for you guys that enabled you to have such consistency and such sustainability in the sport? Yeah, I mean, uh, my parents were smart. They, uh, they knew that you have to instill a passion first in tennis, and that's what makes you want to keep playing. Uh, throughout your whole life. We're still having fun today, but they uh, they inspired us by uh, by taking us to pro matches. Um, you know, they they knew that just drilling us into the ground wasn't the right way, so they uh, they had games with uh, a bunch of our friends. Uh, they had little prizes, you know. Uh, yeah, and just being at the club in this Cabrillo Racket Club, the, this group atmosphere uh, with our friends uh, was key. You know, I, I think uh, every day we went there, we didn't just play tennis, we swam in the pool, made force, as Bob said, and uh, we're just playing with our friends, and uh, that's, uh, that's how we just slowly uh, just started getting better, just by uh, having fun on the court. What was one of the more inspiring parts or see things that you saw early on? Uh, probably going down to see um, Andre Agassi play at Indian Wells. Uh, that's when we said, oh my God, there, there's our idol right there. Uh, that's who we want to emulate and try to be like. Uh, we got his autograph, postered uh, our walls with his pictures, uh, and uh, just that's kind of, we just saw that's where we want to be long term. And, um, and you know, you always want to be like your idols, so uh, we put the work in. And uh, yeah, my, my parents uh, did it right. They, they knew that they showed, gave us a taste of it early, uh, you know, we'd fall in love with the game. Bob, you hear so many horror stories about parents' involvement mm -hmm. and prodigies but you have such a healthy relationship with your family. They're still involved to this day. Yeah. Your dad is omnipresent on the tour yeah. in promoting the sport and so forth. What did they do so right that enabled you not only to have tremendous success, but also to have a positive relationship with them yeah, I mean, into your mid-30s? They try to take the pressure off of us. You know, um, a lot of parents are, it's all about wins and losses. It wasn't about that with my parents. It was about more about sportsmanship, teaching us lessons of uh, hard work and competing fair. Um, I remember one of our first tournaments, Mike was throwing his racket and uh, my mom just walked on the court, yanked him right out of the tournament and, and that was it. That was it. Mike's turn was over and you know then you learn you know you have to be fair, you have to be a good sport and um, yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't about they picked us up when we lost matches you know. Still to this day we um, we lose a tournament out in Paris, and, and we'll get an email five minutes after the match. By the time we get to the locker room, there'll be an email with all the things we've done in our career, you know, picking us back up, pumping us up, um, and uh, that's why we have such a good relationship with them. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of love. It's uh, unconditional love from them. But it's not always easy. There are some challenges, not just with your family, but also with brothers. It's not always the, yeah. the happy, fun, uh, <clears throat> There are some emotional challenges and some conflicts. Uh, what's some of the downside of having such a family business on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I mean, uh, occasionally the lines will get blurred between, um, you know, parents and coaches. Um, you know, there are, there are still pressures out there on the tour. You're playing for a lot of money, points, um, the pressures you put on yourself, the expectations. And, uh, you know, sometimes on the practice court or or wherever, you know, you, could, you might say something to your dad or, or your mom that you don't mean. And, you know, that happens, you know, it's happened a lot. And you feel bad and you, you, you say sorry and you take it back. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's the tough thing about having your parents coach you, you know. Um, but uh, it's been a great ride. I mean, we've had so many great experiences. Our families become tighter and stronger because of it. I need an example. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean... This is where it's going to be tough for you guys because yeah, I, mean, I know a little bit too much. <laughs> but I, I think it's important for people to see. They see so much of the positive side. Yeah. They see so much of what you've accomplished. But 
also, it's another part of the success story is working through those tough times. And sh real unconditional love mm -hmm. is when you can, under adversity, or make a mistake and still be able to bounce back from it. And I know you, you had some tough times under some pressure yeah. at the U.S. Open with your father. Yeah, I mean, um, there's, there's a ton of examples where, um, as Bob said, the, the lines are, are blurred and, and you'll say something to your, to your pop who uh, you love it, uh, so dearly, but, you know, when the pressures get involved, um, you, you sometimes crack and, and you say things you don't mean. Um, this year at the U.S. Open, um, <laughs> you know, uh, we're 34 now, we're mature. My dad's been away from our, our, our careers for a while. He just keeps in touch on the phone and email, but I, I lost it. Uh, he came out to watch a mixed doubles, and um, I, I lost the first set. I was, I was playing poorly. and Because um, he was giving you some he, tweaks on yeah, your shirt. Yeah, right? yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, I know what that's like. He, um, you know, I was serving great. We just won the Olympics. We had a great <laughs> summer. And uh, he always, you know, tries to make us better. And he gave me a couple things on my serve, and he's you know, kind of in my head a little bit, and uh, I, I served a bad first set and mixed, and um, he was doing his characteristic whistle, you probably heard it, um, and, uh, you know, I pointed at him, and I said, you're out of here. I, I said, uh, you know, I, I can't look at you, you're in my head a little bit on my serve. You know, he, he's, he's doing it out of a, you know, he's a loving dad, he wants me to serve better, but um, I told him to leave, and, and he booked his flight, and he, and he left the U.S. Open, he was, he was gonna stay for the whole time, but uh, right away I called him and I said, uh, you know, I'm sorry, uh, Dad, you know, I love you. I, I didn't mean that. You know, we all go insane uh, sometimes, as, as, we, as we all know. Um, but, yeah, then it kind of made us stronger. You know, I came back. Uh, we had a good, uh, a good lunch, talked about it, and uh, here we are. <laughs> and you won the U.S. Open, yeah. and then it's an unconditional. <laughs> so it's, it's really a story of how when you really do care about someone unconditionally, mm -hmm. you do grant them that little bit of extra cushion because you know you're all in it together. Now another great thing that he did and your mother did was instill the importance of another craft and that's music. And mm -hmm. music has been a huge part of the Bryan Brothers success, the Bryan Brothers band. How much has the creativity and also the other stimulus and distraction sometimes of music play a part in the success of your tennis? I mean, uh, yeah, music's big. You know, uh, we always had musical instruments in our living room growing up. We had no TV. So there's a lot of time in the day uh, to get stuff done, homework, so hold on, I think this is very important for today's culture of kids with yeah. multiple stimulus, Xbox and TV yeah. and internet and yeah. iPhones and <clears throat> Androids and all this. Yeah. You guys grew up without TVs. Yeah, I and mean, did it make you closer? It, it, it did. Uh, you know, we always sat down to the dining room table and had, had a dinner um, together as a family. Um, I think TV and the phones, and I mean, I'm, a, I'm guilty of it today. You know, I'm always on my phone looking at this, tweeting. Uh, it just creates that distraction where you, you lose the, the relationships, the close conversations. Um, so I think it was good for us. My parents were smart. You know, take, the, take the four hours a day that you could be um, you know, doing homework or, or you know, playing piano. So we had the instruments set up in, in our living room and we were just jamming. My dad, um, he, it was like tennis. He didn't drill us on music theory or, or learning fingering. It was just one song at a time. Um, you know, learn Johnny Be Good. And uh, that's, that's how we went about it, just memorized one at a time, you know, fell in love with music as well. And uh, to this day, we're still jamming. We had a great gig last night. And, it, and we get that adrenaline, we feel that rush, you know, coming off stage. It's almost more than winning a Grand Slam. For I remember one year after the Australian Open, you guys got to play at the Viper Room, how huge that was for mm -hmm. you. But what yeah. I also remembered was before the final that year, when People sometimes don't realize they almost the expectations because you guys accomplish so much as if it's easy. But especially in doubles, the margins are so small, the mm -hmm. pressure is so high, and the expectations are so high. But the morning, the afternoon of the final, with the night final at the Australian mm -hmm. Open, you were so locked in, Mike, um, on the music and working on the song and the lyrics and the album you guys were working on. How important of a distraction is that so you're not obsessing about the final that day and then you compartmentalize that and yeah. then just focus on the tennis? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good outlet. Um, you know, we bring our instruments on the road. Uh, it really takes our mind off the pressures of, of the court. And uh, when we come back to our room, uh, we're not worrying about, you know, what we're going to do in the final of the, of the Aussie Open. We're, we put our, uh, pick up my guitar, he gets his recording equipment ready and uh, we make songs. And, uh, you know, it, it just really relaxes us. Uh, it works the other part of the brain, you know, the, the right side of the brain. And it, it balances us. And uh, that was huge for, for the Aussie Open. I think we played one of our, our best Grand Slam finals because we were, 
so into working on this this song. It was kind of an inspirational song. Uh, I think you might have played it on the tennis channel for us, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's been huge, and and we put a lot of hours in, into the music, and we worked just as hard on our on our chops in the music room as we do in tennis. And uh, you know, as, as boss, we had an awesome gig. Uh, we played all around the world. We played for uh, Richard Branson at, on uh, Necker Island, um, and he was dancing and and. You know, it's a thrill uh, entertaining people, and it, it's just like uh, you know, it's just like winning a match for us. Yeah, and we've made uh, tons of friends doing it. You know, there are a lot of musicians out there that love tennis, and that's uh, that's who our good friends are today. You know, Jim Bogios from the Counting Crows. We hit balls with him. Um, he comes to slams. Uh, we get out there. We hit a few hours with him, and then he trades it for he plays gigs with us. And we have the best drummer in the world playing drums for us. It blows our mind. And same with James Valentine of Maroon Five, the guitarist. Loves loves hitting balls and we just music exchange. Played at my wedding actually. Yeah, he He's, played. He played guitar. Uh, you know when Lucille walked down the aisle and, and when we walked out. So I mean that's that's pretty cool. Well, it's a great segue to to a lot of people. You guys are identical. I mean, mm -hmm. in every sense of the word. Tough to determine the difference. Obviously, I've known you now for 23 years. I could see the physical uh, differences. But let's take a linear path of how things have gone farther and farther away over the course of the years. It went from college at Stanford where you guys wanted to spend every second together where you'd actually sleep on each other's dorm rooms to now you're living on opposite sides of the country. Bob, you're living in Florida mm -hmm. with your wife. Mike, you just got married. How has the relationship evolved as you've gotten older and change, inevitable change in life has, uh, has revealed itself? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a in some ways grown apart you know we still even though we're on opposite sides of the country I'm calling him every day we still love to share um, moments together and if we do something cool I'm, he's the first guy I call um, you know but we're not so dependent on each other like we were um, at Stanford or, or, or growing up when we were when we were kids you know we're almost viewed as one individual back then and uh, now you know I have my family my, my wife's the center of my world and my baby and you know, those experiences with them are just, I cherish, and that's, I wake up every day, um, you know, to make them happy. And, uh, but, I mean, this guy right here, I mean, he, he's my twin brother, and no one uh, can understand, unless you're a twin, you don't understand that relationship. It's a, it's a, it's a bond that's unbreakable. Um, it's a loyalty that um, people don't, don't get, you know. I'm never going to turn my back on this guy. Mike, was it hard for you? Because Bob beat you to the punch, got married, had a kid, and was there some feeling of, of loss that you were no longer the, the first call, the, the priority for Bob? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was. I mean, uh, I think we've always uh, lived together. We've always been, uh, you know, kind of a package deal. We've always done things together. Um, I, I felt a little, a little empty. Um, <laughs> You know, just, I had a big house, uh, I had a huge music room and no one to jam with. And uh, we, would, we would jam for six hours at a time. And, and now it's just kind of a little bit lonely, you know. Uh, you know, we'd call each other and I'd be like, okay, man, I went to, I did something cool. I got to tell Bob, um, but he's not there, you know. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, it, I think we're always going to be close and uh, be, uh, be together on the road. And, but, uh, you kind of, I wanted to see his baby and she's not there. And, um, you know, you just don't understand if you're, if you're not a twin. Um, it, it feels like you're losing kind of a piece of you. Um, so I eventually uh, want him to get back out on the West Coast. It's pretty funny, yeah. <laughs> we like sell our, where we're at. I'm like, Mike, it's, Miami's great. The beaches yeah. are beautiful, you know. It's so exciting. There's so much to do. You know, check out, the music's awesome. And then he's always, dude, the mountains in California, you know, there's so much variety. <laughs> You know, you can, it, it's yeah. so we're always selling where we are. So you're you know? negotiating where yeah. you're going to end up. Yeah, we're see, like we're like real estate agents. You know, we're trying to. <laughs> this is the place to live. You know, you got to buy over here. Do you see eventually post tennis that you guys will? I mean, is the dream, is the goal to some set up shop, homes next to each other, kids growing up next to each other, yeah. tennis, music, life, and and picking up. Yeah, where I mean, you guys started? Yeah. I think we're at our happiest when we're uh, together sharing things. Um, sometimes our, our wives get a little jealous that our, our unique bond is so close, but I think we've always envisioned kind of living in the same area, or hopefully the same street, and having our kids, uh, you know, play together. And, but, uh, 
we got to convince this guy to get back out. To, <laughs> to you West. touched on that, the wives. Yeah. How difficult has it been adding that dynamic where the women, and it's just the evolution of life, it's the cycle of life, marriage, yeah. kids, but how tough has it been for them to understand the bond that you guys go through and also just the, the dynamics of the relationship of how it's changed with you with Bob's wife. Now Mike got, just got married, Mike, you with Lucille. Yeah. I mean, how has that affected the <coughs> Bryan Brothers team dynamic? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. We, I mean, we have two great girls. Um, Michelle's perfect for me. Lucille's perfect for Mike. Um, our bond is, like you said, it's unique. It's not normal. Uh, twins are a small percentage of the population. And uh, we're best friends. And w with our life and our travel and staying in hotel rooms and all over the world, we're, we're always together. And to put these two girls who... They have stuff in common. They like a Brian, but not totally in common. So they have to be best friends, which doesn't always work. You know, um, they are great friends, but Michelle's, you know, she's a lawyer. Lucille's this. They're, they're, they come from different cultures. She has Cuban upbringing. Uh, Lucille's Welsh, you know. Um, to, to throw them and make them get along uh, perfectly doesn't always work, you know. Um, so we've had problems with it in the past. Luckily, um, things are great you know right now and uh hopefully they'll be great f for futures and we'll be having christmases together and but um yeah it's it's not normal for sometimes for for girls and this whole relationship to to work smoothly you know the circle doesn't always uh work perfectly but everyone views you guys as one but you actually have grown quite different over the years um, your games are different. You complement and offset each other as well. You defend each other's weaknesses. You accentu accentuate each other's strengths. Uh, but also personally, as you've mm -hmm. grown, and I mean, Mike mm -hmm. is much more the rigid one, much more of the obsessive, compulsive, gluten, <laughs> you know, I organized. Thought. Bob, <laughs> you're a lot more of a grip it and rip it type of guy. Yeah. I mean, is that the way you see the dynamic? Yeah, I mean, we've uh, we're, we're totally different. Uh, if people coming in the inner circle and know us, uh, our personalities are just <laughs> way apart. You know, uh, Bob's obsessive with his dirt, certain things. He's more the creative one. Um, if you see with uh, Michaela's Twitter, um, you know, he, he loves that type of stuff. He loves uh, taking photos and embellishing them with um, certain saturations and different <laughs> this and that. Uh, he loves recording. You know, I, I am a kind of a obsessive compulsive. Uh, you know, I got my strict diet. Uh, I like to stay organized, have every you know hour of the day allotted. Um, you know, if I f find a different exercise that makes me stronger, I'll, I'll do it all day, every day, for forever. Uh, but y you know, it's it's uh, we do complement each other. Our personalities, when we're together, it's uh, he's got a certain side that balances me out. I keep him on time, and uh, you know, on, on the court, you said uh, it, it it works well on the court too. You know, he's he's the grip it and rip it guy. He's creative. He hit that between the leg shot that saved the U.S. Open. You know, I would have never tried that. Um, and uh, you know, I got the return. You got the big serve. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. It's like we uh, we got separate hemispheres of the brain working. And I'm always always trying to be more like him. I'm trying to be more creative. And uh, but it, it's 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 tough to get to where he is. You know, I don't think I'll ever get there. Is, it, <laughs> is there a telepathy between you two? Um. Yeah, I mean, th there is. I mean, I know what he's thinking at, at all times. We were, What's he uh, thinking right now? He's thinking, uh, how much longer do we have to do this? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Is the <laughs> no, but um, it's just we've spent every waking hour of every day of our whole life together. We've seen it, you know, the world through each other's eyes. And so we react the same way to a lot of situations. And, um, you know, it, it, like Mike said, it helps on the court because... I can I know what to say to him at, at the right time. If he's a little tight, I can pump him up. I know if he's tight. I know how he's feeling after a match. Um, yeah, it's just uh, it's a good deal. We're, we are. Um, I think that's intimidating to opponents. You know, they see that that it almost feels like we're we're one out there. And um, you know, when they sit see us sitting this close to each other in the locker room before a match, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's a little bit unsettling when. You know, Nestor and sometimes his his uh, partner sit in different locker rooms, you know, and we're always kind of on the same page and quick to, um, you know, get we, we're quick to get over losses, too, because we clear the airways, you know.